This is NHTV2, North Haven Government Television, a service of North Haven Community Television. The following program is brought to you through the support of the town of North Haven. I'd like to call our January 18th workshop to order. Our first presentation is library. Thank if you'd you. like to take us through your uh, proposal. Yep, I just want to introduce myself. I am the new library director. My name is Susan Griffiths. I started on November 18th. So this is my first budget. Um, I would like to introduce, um, beside me, Michael Fletcher is our library board president. We have uh, Shona DeStefano is the library assistant director. Ruth Bryant, Ralph Black, Kathy Imholt, and Paul Colella are all library board members. So thank you for your support and being here. Um, so I did just start as uh, the director, and just to give you a little background about myself, um, I became a librarian because of the North Haven Library. Um, I almost stumbled into this uh, job as an accident uh, because I loved the library and uh, ended up going back to get my master's degree and um, I worked for Quinnipiac University for about 10 years uh, in both the Arnold Bernhard Library and the Edward and Barbara Netter Library, which is on the Health Sciences campus. But when I saw the opportunity to come back to North Haven, I jumped at it. Um, I love this town. I love this community. I live here. Um, I'm a proud resident. Um, I want to work for you and for the town. Um, my predecessor always said, we work for the public, and I wholly believe that. So. Um, I, I feel that it's important to start with the mission of the library because that's what we're here for. And the mission of the library is to provide library resources and services to address the informational, educational, cultural, and recreational needs of the community of North Haven. So that's what we're here for. Um, to that, I would like to start with our statistics sheet. Everybody should have this on the top of their packet, the informational graphic. And if you'd like to take a look at that, um, we had over 62,000 visits last year to our library, which is over 200 people per day walking in the door. Um, 9,300 residents have a library card, which is 39% of the town. Um, we have answered or helped with over 38,000 transactions. So it's an average of 127 people per day that come to the library for help and ask for help. That it's not just checking out a book that actually need help. Um, our digital items, I mean, I'm uh, sorry, our, our circulating items, we have 184,639 items that uh, circulated last year, which is a 6% increase from the year before. <coughs> our e-items, which is e-books, audio books, uh, downloadables, and streaming, uh, that's up to 18,779, which is a 17.9% increase. The year before was a 22% increase, so it's, it's a highly uh, moving fast uh, area of, of circulation. We did have 12,833 computer sessions, which is over 42 per day. You know, everybody thinks that people have computers in their homes, but we still have quite a few people um, using computers in our library. Excuse me, do you have printers here? Mm -hmm. We have one um, printer that is uh, accessible through all of our uh, desktop computers. And we just installed a wireless uh, printer, mm -hmm. which has just had some difficulties. <laughs> so it may be getting replaced, but that'll be a warranty issue. But So we're trying to go wireless to help uh, anybody who's right. not on our computer system. Um, as far as programming goes, we had 264 programs for adults and 306 programs for children's and teen. So we had over 14,000 people um, attend our library programs this year. And uh, when we compare ourselves to pair libraries, we have 34.4% more programs offered than um, that core group of uh, our pair libraries. Uh, what's new on this uh, this year is uh, I was able to access through Google Analytics our library website usage. So I thought that might be of interest because a lot of people are, are accessing the library starting with our website. And we had over 18,000 users of our website last year. Um, 45,000 <coughs> sessions and 80, over 80,000 web page views. And it's, it's kind of interesting to find out how people are accessing um, the website. So they're, you know, just about between um, mobile and tablets, 
is 50% split between that and accessing us by a computer. Does anybody have any questions about any of our stats? I just have one quick question. Sure. Just from the CAFA report, and again, I don't know whether this is uh, uh, up to date, but um, it seems like the volumes in collection <coughs> statistics seems to be going down over time. I is that a shift to more digital uh, transactions or digital formats of uh, materials or? Well, they're def we're definitely putting more funding into electronic resources, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but sometimes between the age of books and the condition of books, you get rid of them. You can't always get older books to be reprinted. Um, so, uh, but you purchase we, new books. Every we year. are purchasing new books uh, like crazy. Right. Yeah, right. I'm just wondering why the overall volume seems to be dwindling over time. Uh, we, we, part of a library consortium of 29 mm -hmm. libraries, Lion, so we also have access to access. all the other libraries. Right. So we try to see what is going out and, um, like say for new bestsellers, we only get X amount and then, you know, if we find that the there's 200 holds, we'll buy more. Right. So. Um, but what you have, you're circulating, obviously, oh, quite a very bit. Yeah, and it, it, it's continuing to grow year after year Great. in both adult and children's departments. Okay, thank you for clarifying. Sure. I have a question. Sure. Have you th thought about putting having an app for the library or just the website? Um, I did actually look into that before I got hired just to see. Um, it's quite a bit of money. It would probably be about $10,000 a year, uh, which sounds crazy to think, but it has to integrate um, both our library catalog, our program catalog. Uh, uh, we have a programming uh, software that we use, so it, would, it can integrate that the library catalog, which is through our consortium, as well as our website, so it's it's, it's a lot of moving pieces. Uh, I think it would be great if somebody can open their phone and say programs, website, catalog, but because there's three moving parts, it's um, it's not <coughs> not cost effective. Right. right. <laughs> so you're trying maybe, to say it to maybe next year's budget, you might see that on here, but not this year. Okay. But I did look at it. Yes. Susan, mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> help me out here. You mentioned thirty-eight thousand reference transactions mm -hmm. that does not include um, like drawing out books and what have you. Give me an example of what, what, what they are. Well, sometimes people will call on the phone and say, I don't have the paper, can you look up this obituary? Um, sometimes people will say, can you help me download this app? I don't know how, to, like, uh, so that I could read an, you know, a book on my phone. Mm -hmm. um, Sometimes it's, what's the weather? <laughs> Sometimes it's, uh, I need to do some research on a project. I don't know, can you help me find books on this topic and or this subject? And then we might even show them the databases that we have or help them find books in the collection. So it really runs the gamut. They could be an informational type thing. Like, you know, it's, it's not where's the bathroom. <laughs> it's something you need staff to actually help you get that answer. Okay, great, thanks. You're welcome. Any other questions? Can I continue, please. Okay. So, um, okay. I just want to see. So, just want to give you a little background about our programs. Um, everybody has a program flyer here, and this is our um, winter spring, which is January through March uh, program flyer. And in the past um, year, just some highlights. We've had um, programs by local professors from Quinnipiac, Yale, Southern, Norwalk Community College, as well as local North Haven teachers. Uh, Mr. Fiendel and Mr. Johnson both have done um, his history programs on World War II and um, the Leatherman. Uh, we work with local groups like Peter's Rock, the Garden Club, Daytime Gardeners, the Rotary Club, the Historical Society, um, Ted Stockman has done programs. I don't know if everybody's familiar with Ted, our local historian, uh, police officer, um, and of course our friends of the library. We do a lot of work with them. Um, they're very supportive of us. We have health and wellness program. Our meditation program is very popular, and if um, we have it coming up in February at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, so if anybody needs an afternoon break, it's, it's a, for your health and <laughs> well-being, it's a wonderful program. It's guided meditation. Um, <clears throat> history uh, programs, including reenactments, um, have been very popular. We have programs on art, gardening, our concert series, including the North Haven High School Select Choir and Jazz have um, come, and we, we pack the house at that point. We're standing room only. 
we have writing workshops and of course book clubs so um, we really try to and I really mentioned a lot of the adult programs and of course we have children's programs for varying age groups um, and we, we want to instill the love of reading and you know again support our our uh, mission so um, that's a little bit about programs. Does anybody have any questions about programs? No, just a comment. I have a daughter in college and one who's a freshman, and they utilize the services. And I was telling the woman on the board that, and my daughter who was in college volunteered for the kids program in the summer to take them oh, through, yes, and now yes. I have a freshman who already did it. So the programs and everything that you did and they participated in has been instilled in them that they have chosen like library to want to volunteer for the kids. Oh, so that's I just wonderful. wanted to let you know that the help in that they've got over the years in the programs has been, you know, they remember that and they're giving back by picking the library to do volunteer work because they did utilize a lot of the programs, went in with a lot of research and needed help and I just wanted to let you know that that it influenced them. Oh that's wonderful. Thank you. That's what we're here for. You know, I mean we want people to want to walk in our doors, be excited, come to us and we can help them and have them leave with a smile. And whatever they needed to come in, you know. Um, so I suppose we should talk about budget, huh? Just one other question. Sure. Uh, to what extent do you coordinate with the senior center? Uh, in terms of de designating programs uh, targeted towards our, our seniors in town? Um, we don't work with them very often. We <coughs> have worked with them in the past. Um, I don't remember what program we did. We, we try to make sure we don't replicate. Sure, you don't so want that, duplication, you know, of course, um, but, but there might be something that each, each group can bring together to make an even better program. Um, we have uh, we have worked with them in the past, but not we're not currently okay. working. Well, just something to keep in mm -hmm. mind. Thank you. Great. Does the senior center bus run to the library? Yes. Mm -hmm. For sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Your budget items. Okay. <coughs> okay. So this year, um, the first thing that I asked for an increase in is the personnel, the part-time personnel, and that is really just to fund our current staff. Um, I'm not really sure why in the past it looks like it was over the line has been over but we do have um, 25 employees and um, I put in um, my narrative the other pair towns but I, I went back and looked in the state um, angelic rating which is the financial closeness of, you know what the ta how the towns are rated the between the populations of um, so if we're 23,691 in North Haven, this is the pair libraries between with well, a population of 20,000 to 26,000. In the angelic rating, we're 70. They're between 59 and 106, 106 being lower. Um, and we have five less employees than uh, two libraries, nine less than one library, and the, the one that has the lowest uh, angelic rating, they have 39 employees to our 25. So I am asking to keep our current staff as is. I'm not asking for anybody additional, but I'm just asking that that line get funded fully. Does anybody have any questions on that? It's, it's so we have desk coverage, and I mean basically that we you know we have enough people to run the library. <laughs> so so the increase there is is uh, you're talking about part time. It's it's the part time budget line. Yes. Yeah. So the that increase is. <coughs> is due to a higher pay rate if you're not asking for anyone more? Or? I'm not asking for anybody additional. There is an increase in there for um, two of our pages, which are the people who put the books away, get paid minimum wage, so it does uh, account for that increase. Uh, but it's, it's really just to fund the current staff. I'm not sure why in the past it had been run over. Um, we've had some... So, Susan, if I can... Is yes. it hours or is it a pay increase? It is not. It's 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 to fund everybody as is. It's it's to fund the current staff. Um, there's no. The only pay increase is for the minimum wage on the pages. So for two years, based on these numbers, it nobody adjusted it to be what it really should have been. Correct. That's what you're saying. Yes. I think part of the problem was. I mean, we've had a couple of. Uh, <coughs> <clears throat> Un, maybe unplanned for or like if somebody's on maternity leave and we we need to make sure our desk is covered 
there you know we don't have that person in the building for three months or six months so you know th it, again it's our current staff it's the same amount of staff that's been here since I started over three years ago so it you're you are correct it, it didn't get adjusted I'm not sure why I just would like it to be balanced okay thank you mm, any other questions on that okay um, the next is in office supplies. We do have a uh, new high volume uh, Xerox uh, copy machine. It's just part of the new contract. Uh, every five years, these um, machines get recontracted. So the new contract is a little bit more, but this machine, um, we, are, we do have the capability of doing color. So our program flyers, um, due to keeping the cost down, the cover is color, but the insides are black and white. And um, we do pay for each copy on that. It's priced a little bit differently. So that's why I asked for a little bit more in office supplies to make sure that that is covered. So is that a lease or are we it's own a lease. it? It's a lease. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's what I thought. Thank you. Yep. And the copies you mentioned here, we don't charge for copies? These are the copies we're making for our program flyers. For the public <coughs> copier, we do charge for copies. We have two Xerox machines. Okay, so these are your programs. These saying. are for right, our, okay. and you know, any yeah. like internal right. or, yeah. yeah. <coughs> Any other questions on that? Okay, um, I did ask for, um, well the, the next is the custodial contract, that's just per contract, so I put what the town has contracted, so there's a small increase there. Um, the books uh, are materials line, which is books, magazines, and reference. I asked for a 2.13% increase to cover. Um, it's, it's basically the cost of inflation. Uh, found out from our main, um, book and materials supply vendor, every material that we purchase from them, what the increase is going up that they have that's not just projected, it's what it will be in 20, 2020. So that is just to cover the costs of materials going up. So it's just inflation. So it's a $2,200 increase. 2252 is what I'm asking for there. And that will cover you? You're not, you're not shortchanging you? So no. No, I mean, we got a decent increase um, last year in the overall line, so we're able to purchase materials, and like, as Nancy was asking, or you know, we're getting enough materials, we are. Um, but this covers the cost of what those prices are being raised. Okay. okay. Um, and then the last is in our programming, and I did ask for $2,000 more, uh, and that is because we do quite a bit of programming, as, as you can see. Um, our programs are very popular, people love them. And we just want to be able to bring in different presenters, um, and they charge. <laughs> so we just would love to be able to increase, um, and that would be split between both the adult department and the children's department. And what about, um, there, I didn't see anything for like maintenance. So in the past few years, we've heard about maintenance for either needing shelving, painting, you know, roof, mm -hmm. all of that. I mean, it's except, well, exception of what you're asking of this, I'm not talking about that, but. I didn't ask for anything. Our building, uh, as is, is okay, <coughs> except our burner, our um, boilers, right. which I will talk <coughs> to you about with the, um, Cap the capital. Um, <coughs> but it's recently been painted. Uh, we just had the floor in the elevator redone, which is wonderful. Um, I think we're okay structurally for for, for now. Okay. <laughs> Just checking because I know every year there's always like no something. leaks in the roof. No leaks. Or, you know, it actually hasn't been too bad. That's I have my it. question. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I haven't. You know what? And there always Don't are. Don't jinx it. There always are small leaks, and I think they've been there since the beginning. Yes. But knock on wood, mm -hmm. I don't. Th I haven't seen anything major. We did just have our um, roof rails. Uh, they basically put snow guards up on the roof rails, so that's that's a wonderful thing, and so that's that's a large chunk that we don't have to worry about, and that um, holds the snow back so that the sun can beat on it and it can melt and then go into the gutters. So I think we're okay on that. Okay, yeah. just checking. No, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Yeah, because the building I was there before that that leaked too. Um, and by the way, the uh, icicles uh, sometimes they. Uh, they're a little dangerous around the entrance. That's the snow guards. Well. And I think the snow guards will hopefully prevent that. Yeah. Um, and I, I was outside on the front lawn with the guy with the crane saying, wait a minute, are you drilling into the metal roof? <laughs> because I was really afraid that he's like, we've got these great metal roof guards. And he said, no, 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 because I'm like, 
I don't want leaks. No, no <laughs> holes. <laughs> but there's guards up there, and they were drilling into the guards. Um, the, the I'm sorry, there's rails up there, and they were drilling into the rails to make put the new roof guards on. So. You'd like to take us through your capital? Sure. Okay. So the first thing that is on capital is um, PC replacements for the children's department. Um, is anybody familiar with Vista? The Vista operating system. Uh, yeah, that like really doesn't exist. <laughs> that is what is on the children's computers. Uh, many of, um, I think we have some uh, staff who actually, as children, played on these yeah. actual yeah. computers. They're they they're they're ready. So um, this number is sixteen thousand five hundred, and the computers that I would um, like to replace them with are called Awe. And they are um, touch screen, they're designed, they have educational programming on them. They don't access the internet, so we don't have any worries about that. But they, um, there's uh, different age groups and they're, they're designed for children. Um, they can take a beating <coughs> and we will have two for, um, we have one for zero to three now in the building. I want to put uh, two from like, like say the four to eight year olds and then the eight to 12 year old or so. Um, two for the younger group, two for the older group, and then we have one bilingual that is in here. So we're only talking about five pieces of equipment for 16,000? Yes, they're specialized. I do have um, the quote here if you'd like to take a look at them. Um, I did some research to see <coughs> if there's anything else like that. Um, they're not, but th there's pretty much, they kind of have the market cornered but we've had one now that's like eight or it might even be 10 years old and, and, and you've got kids like basically beaten on it and we don't have to worry about them doing anything inappropriate on them okay what's the advantage of a touch screen over a mouse well there's my uh, a mouse for each computer as well right, but a lot of the the kids are tablet oriented and especially with the the little guys the zero to threes they're they're playing on it they're they can use the mouse, but it's it's just a lot easier for them to, to <coughs> use. Okay. Is there just five computers that have Vista on it, or do we have more? We have seven down there now. Actually, um, two of them. Yeah, I know it's it's. They you, keep you can't turning patch on every those, day. That you can't patch those computers, <coughs> oh, so no, no, you're no. open to a vulnerability of a security. Somebody going into those computers, and it it could happen. I have everything. Um, uh, blacklisted except for BookFlix, which, which is one of our, um, as far as inter, uh, internet access. Uh, it's a database that is, you know, it's a book type of thing that, um, that's the only thing they can get to on those computers. So hopefully. Yeah, but it, it, and my point is that you're doing what you can, but it's still a risk when oh, you yes. have old technology, someone could hack into it and not just hack in that way and get to that's what I'm mm -hmm. that's Correct. what as an no it's definitely as an it's IT not person by, that, like yeah yes. that's not good well and I, f I figured that this still could help you realize the age of the computers like I said they're yeah. still turning on but they're turning on but there's no patches there's no security updates there's no nothing no. so you're vulnerable mm -hmm. and that's how a cyber attack could happen they mm -hmm. could come in mm -hmm. and they're getting into the network and take it from there so yes Yep. We need to get rid of these. Or Assuming these work out so. the way you want, I assume maybe next year you'll ask for two more. Actually, if you're, I, if I'm running with I don't now. know because you know what? I think if we have two per uh, the younger age group, then two for the next age group. I that think. Works for you? Yeah, I mean they're not hanging out on them. If they are, if it we find that they're so wildly popular, then possibly. But at this point, I don't think we're going to need that. Okay. And your last item in cap um, staff oh, lockers. No, staff lockers is um, $2,800. Um, that's been on there for a few years, but we have some doors falling off. A lot don't close. Sometimes we've called public works. Somebody's jacket's stuck. Can you please come here and help us open them? <laughs> you know, because it's locked and the, the handle's <clears throat> falling off. So it would just be lovely to have some staff okay. lockers. Um, and then the boiler replacement. Oh, does anybody have any questions about the lockers? No. I didn't bring pictures, but I figured they're self-explanatory. Um, the boiler replacement, if everybody can just, I've given you a new sheet. Um, it was under the program flyer. I initially put in 50000 because I started on uh, the day after the budget was uh, given to us. And um, I did not have time before I had to submit this to get um, a proper quote so I talked with FNF Mechanical asked them for a ballpark and they said $50,000 
I've been working with FNF Mechanical, who is our town contractor, and um, they brought in an electrician, a boiler manufacturer, um, several other people, and I have a real quote, which was a little bit surprising, and I just wanted to go over it with you, so I made this sheet up, because we've gone from 50,000 to 84, 141, which is a significant jump from the ballpark that I was given. Uh, I do want to tell you that we are at the end of the life of our uh, boilers, and we have been band-aiding in the past couple years and thinking maybe we'd get through, but basically, um, I mean, we've had three to five times a year at least that we walk in where we're, there's no heat. I literally walk in the door and stand there for a second and go, okay, we're good today. Um, I've had two times no heat this year and another emergency um, <coughs> replacement just the other day when... Um, AJ from FNF was going over this quote with me. He went and checked the boilers. There was an alarm on, and that picture that's um, right here is um, our burner on boiler number two. So, you know, what happened? I've learned a lot about HVAC, <laughs> and a lot of our the components of the system are um, old and rusted out, and uh, they don't even make some of the proper replacement parts now, or maybe they're not brand new. So um, we're spending a lot of money on repairs to fix one thing to have another go. So um, like the, the repair. We're a gas system. You're a gas system there? Mm-hmm. Right. Ed, I'm assuming. will be changed. Ed, I'm assuming we, I mean, we have a quote, but we can probably bid this right Yes. Now. It's over the threshold. We have to. Right. Mm -hmm. What kind of warranty do you get with this? Ten year. Ten years? Ten year on um, <coughs> mechanics, one year on parts and labor. Um, but there's uh, some other additional warranties on certain components of it. So I do have that information available. Um, but just to let you know, like the repair the other day is probably $3,000 for parts and labor. That just was, you know, there's the burner. Um, so the last two years we were over in that line because of the repairs, $24,000 and $19,000. So. As much as this is a shocking number with the 84, 141, if you look at the cost benefit analysis, um, our system now it'll, is about. It'll get changed. It'll get changed. Yeah. There's no reason not to. Okay. Right. Well, it, we will save a lot of money. Oh, yeah. It's no. going to pay for itself in 10 years. Well, I just figured, let me put it since we're on. It will pay for itself in 10 years with the um, energy efficiency. And if it, it's supposed to be a 30 year life expectancy, if we're saving, I know it's probably not, but if we did go yeah. look at that, we're saving $167,000 after the system's paid for itself. And just if anybody's wondering, these are lock and bar burners, um, not burners, uh, boilers. It's a two boiler system, and um, these are what were put in the police department in 2014. And um, they've only, they've never had any service calls, just the maintenance. So they're the same <coughs> ones that are in the middle school. Um, and they're highly efficient and just they're made so much better than they used to be. Yeah. So it's, it's an investment that. And the 600,000 BTU uh, satisfies the right temperature for the whole oh, building? Yes. You, all your floors are equally mm -hmm. heated. Mm -hmm. <coughs> what temperature do you put that on? It depends. Uh, it's, it's, it's kind of weird because the system is a little off so sometimes it says it's 73 but it might actually be 69 <laughs> you know and um, like in our community room for example if I bump it one degree from 69 to 70 degrees it's 76 degrees in there if I bump it from 69 to 68 it's 65 degrees in there. so we try to keep I don't know what it's truly maintained at but it's around 70 degrees give or take so the 600,000 can satisfy the... Oh, yes. Limits. Oh, no, these are... I mean, this this is... The, the rep came down from Boston. Um, I've learned so much about boilers. I, it, it, I think that it's pretty pretty comprehensive, and, you know, okay. they don't want this to come back to them. Yeah. <laughs> so... I don't think you're going to have to worry about a boiler replacement. We should maybe try and do something even sooner. I will tell you, it can't be... It has to be done in, like... June and they can't retrofit w what we have we have to band-aid until we get through this season mm -hmm. and then um, when this does get replaced they will put up a plastic sheeting we have to um, clear out a, l a small part of the library it'll be about a two-week installation and um, everything will kind of happen behind that that plastic wall 
and but it, it has to be done when it's warmer out. Yeah, okay, understood. Anybody have any questions about the I boiler? Any other questions? The Ninety-seven percent efficiency is better than my boiler. <laughs> <laughs> I only got eighty-five percent. That's good. When I, when I went to propane, I went to ninety-eight percent. Really? That's what this is. And it's, it's, and it's amazing. Yeah. So it's really. Yeah, it's that's why it's a it's a no-brainer. Yeah. 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 You got it. Stop talking about it. You might lose it. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted you to know why I went from fifty to that number, uh, and that you know done a research so give us a reason to think about it too long nope nope I'll, Susan I'll I just it. want to say to you that as our newest department head you've done a great job you've integrated yourself very nicely with all the other department heads everybody enjoys working with you oh, we you so Ed and I enjoy working with you here at town hall <coughs> thank you for the nice job you've done yes thank you very much thank, thank you. you Susan thank you Michael take care we appreciate it okay. thank, thank you. you Mr. Swinkowski would you like to shoot from there or do you want to sit in front oh. of there? okay <laughs> okay <laughs> thanks thank you thank you When are you starting with? Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, you're fine. Yeah, I think so. No. There's no handout, right, Ed? No. no. Yeah. This is the bus. like four, so. <laughs> nice we just got to get Kel to switch to you. Does the camera even go there? Yep, got it. Oh, this is You're on. So You're on now. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Kukowski? Community service. Uh, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm here today as representing the Community Services and Recreation Department. And what I'd like to do is just take you quickly through the budget. And there's only a few pages, and they're not really a lot of changes, so I'll just I'll touch on the changes as I go through. If you start with page 33 under Community Services, the only increases there are to the personnel full-time line. That, con that line would normally stay flat because although they've ratified their contract on their end, we're still waiting to have, have it finalized, so the increases are still sitting in the contract obligations line. I'm hoping if we get it done before the budget's finalized, they can move them over. But at, as of right now, that's still in process. So, And that represents, the increase that's there represents three step increases for people. Okay. And there's a slight increase in the professional consultants, and that is for BH Care. And they've been with us, I want to say, for eight, ten years now. And I think they've helped out the department quite a bit. Uh, they've added a lot of resources that we didn't have before. And they've helped with training of our staff, and it's just been, from my point of view, a, real, a really good um, company to have working with us. In addition to that, because of the way they go about their counseling business, it's helped increase a lot of individual counseling to group counseling. And as over that 10-year period, we've seen the revenue grow from 60,000 to now it's up to 260,000, as you'll see in the revenue budget. So, <clears throat> on page 34. The first two items are provided to us by the, the individual agencies. Regional Health requested 151,622. Uh, visiting Nurse, 32,160, which actually, I guess, is a little $3,000 less than last year, which is a good thing. <coughs> Welfare, same. Senior Center, the first line, the hey, first. Hey, I'm sure. sorry. Um, so what happens on Quinnipiac Valley Health? They do their budget and just split them up amongst the member towns? Is that what right, they're doing? Right, right. Yeah. So is that why they're not listed in our table of employment? They're an agency. They're an agency. They're, an agency. Yeah. they're, an outside they're not, right. they're not they're our local. employees or anything. They're just an outside <coughs> agency. Yeah. But don't we have a, a director and a no. another no. staff no. member? No. That no, we have no. 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 So we just kick into it? Correct. Okay. <coughs> in the past we did. Okay. Sort of like the library does with Lion. They kick into that co cooperative. Well, that's a different thing, but. You're moving to Senior Center? Yeah, on, on the Senior Center, you'll see that the personnel increased. Again, there's step increases here, except one of the individuals, we worked with the clerical union, and we're able to help get one of the drivers to do some maintenance work. 
So we were, what was happening before was public workers was running over there all the time to do work, taking two guys, time, trucks, and vehicles, and it just added up to a lot of expense. So we're working with one of the individuals who was interested in public works, said he'd do it, so we worked with the union on getting an MOU on that. So that's part of that increase there. Okay. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> Building maintenance. Uh, there was one or two bigger items, I think, last year. So I put it back to 6,500 and just increased the dues in training to 12,750. 12, Training is the same. You what, mean custodial contract? Yes. Custodial contract. Custodial contract, right? You said. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Custodial right. contract, right? What's the car allowance? Increase? For when some of the staff travel. Oh, okay. And the mileage rates for the IRS has gone up too this year, so it's a little bit more. Recreation. Uh, the next page. In this case. It's, the whole budget is decreased by 5%. If you look at the personnel full-time line, we've had two positions. One of them came in at lower salary, but then decided to leave to, to live with their family in another, in another state. So that came in again at another at a lower, lower rate when he left. And then a second person left. So that's going to reflect two lower rated, lower... Um, Beginning of the steps. Yeah, step people. Okay. And other than that, everything else is pretty much constant. Any questions for Mrs. Minkowski? Carry a big stick there, Ed. Nice job. Yeah. yeah. Well, that, you, you know, the, uh, the consultant hats. Right. The, so, the social work uh, uh, consulting line. Right. Uh, you know, that, that's one area that we don't want to underfund, you know, so. No, that. So that's in for so got a slight increase in it. Yes. Yeah. That consultant yeah. line. Yeah. And I just want to say, you know, our, our counselors do a great job. They've got a 160 client list of clients that they deal with throughout the year. And this year, Sarah told me that their client discharge rate was 52%. So I thought that was pretty good because it's been improving year after year. In other words, the people that come in, they were able to successfully discharge them. Not that they're 100% cured, but they're better off than when they visited the center. As long as everyone in the town knows that that service is there if they need it. Yeah. No, it is. Yep. And, and, and while I'm on that too, I think also thank the, the, the public and all the businesses and individuals who over, over the years have helped us with donations for the toys, the food bank, and everything else. So, thank you, Ms. McCaskey. Kelly, if we could take two minutes. Chief Ron, would you like to take us through your presentation. Sure. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for uh, assembling here this morning to. Here once again, the uh, annual fire department budget, just for the purposes of, of reinforcing some of the things I'll discuss, and for visual aid purposes, I have a PowerPoint. It's uh, you'll find it much shorter than in the past, so uh, hopefully we'll get through it. Of course, any questions at all, please uh, please let me know. But I have this designed so that I think I can answer most of the questions I anticipate as we move on. So I wanted to start first with just kind of acknowledging the Board of Finance and the role that it's played in the fire department in recent years. Uh, the reason you're going to find perhaps some of today somewhat shorter than in the past is because we've come so far. Uh, we, we've really done a great job in the last couple of years of starting to identify the needs and address the needs and I just want to thank the Board of Finance and I, I think it's important that they realize what an integral role they play in the operations of the department. As you know, we're an all-hazards department. It includes fire suppression, EMS, safety, code inspection, and most importantly, fire education. Um, it's a collaboration of efforts through the Board of Finance, Board of Fire Commission, and Board of Selectmen that we're allowed to operate, and uh, we have support to operate. And just one thing that's worth noting is, is this budget is presented for the best needs of the department, and without... Um, any particular interest or, or financial interest. This is what we've identified as the deficiencies moving forward. And I would just uh, want to disclaim that quickly. Our responses. So our responses in 2019, we responded to more calls than we had ever responded to in the past. It was a record year for us. We don't see any reason that that's gonna go down or trend down. It, all, uh, all indicators are that it's gonna continue to trend up. Over the last five years, a 12% increase in our calls. 
there's been a 64% uh, total in EMS calls, 29% fire related, and seven motor vehicle accidents. We talked in the past a lot about simultaneous calls occurring. Uh, there's 23% of the calls that occurred in 2019 occurred at the same time as another incident. So it just gives some indication of, of having to have uh, multiple resources in place to be able to respond to uh, the increase in call volume and the calls that are occurring at the same time as one another. Often get asked, when do the calls occur? So this is just something that um, our software program is able to populate. And while you can see that it trends down from about midnight to four or five, uh, six in the morning, uh, the rest of the day it's, it's significantly higher. Uh, and it's worth noting that typically in those overnight hours are when we get the most severe calls, the most severe motor vehicle accidents, the most severe house fires with people possibly trapped because they're sleeping. So the call volume alone isn't an indicator of severity. In terms of weekdays versus weekends, uh, there's a slight decrease on the weekends, but not an appreciable difference. Pretty much seven days a week, the call volume is consistent. Our future responses, the reason I say it's gonna trend up, uh, you look at something like the Vine Street Medical Center. Uh, 2016, when that first started to develop, it was 185 times we had responded there. As recently as last year, it's 325 <coughs> times. Development such as this is, is going to uh, continue to increase our call responses, and we just need to uh, keep that in mind as we plan for the future. We have a higher uh, distribution of, of 65 and older residents in our towns, a little bit higher than the state average. We have a lot of highways in this town. I haven't been able to find this as fact, but I've been told this over and over, is that we have more lane miles of highway than any other town in the state. When you consider we have Route 15, Route 40, 91, 91 at one point is, is an eight lane highway. Uh, we have a lot of highway and we're on the, the highway a lot for various incidents, ranging from medicals to fires to, to accidents. That uh, seems to be, is that up? Because I noticed, well, maybe it's just news alerts, but there's constant on that stretch of 91 or, or Mary, you guys are getting called to the scene a lot. Yeah, it's, it does seem like it's going up. The number of cars on the highways is even increasing, so that has something to do with it. Uh, but we, we are seeing that that's trending up as well. Uh, Amazon alone, it's, started operating about the summer of 2019. We've been there 78 times already. And we, uh, there's future development, as we're all aware of, that's coming that we anticipate our call response to continue to increase. Chief, that seems really high. I mean, it can't be the building, right? Is it, those are all medical? What are those? For which bill? For Amazon. Which? Amazon. For Amazon? Amazon? Yeah, it's a split. It's, it's a lot of medical, believe it or not. Yeah. Um, but there are, when they first opened, there were some issues with the fire alarm. There's been already a couple of issues there. Uh, with, with sprinklers letting go and so forth. So there has been some fire calls there, but I'd say for the most part, it's, it's medicals. Right. And what that's not identifying is it's not identifying motor vehicle accidents in the area of uh, attributing to those employees. Yeah. As you know, we're a combination department. We rely on both career firefighters and volunteer firefighters to respond to our various incidents. We continue to stay active with national recruitment campaigns, statewide recruitment <coughs> campaigns. We um, have banners up in front of the firehouses. They may not be up this time of year because they'll get damaged too fast, but we continue recruitment efforts in the schools. We even started an Explorer program this past year where we visited a high school during lunch and we started an Explorer program where we're bringing on uh, high school age children between the ages of 14 and 18. Um, to develop them into volunteer firefighters when they turn 18. Even if it was for two, three years, it's, it's worth it. It's, it's something that we can plan for. So we continue to try to improve our volunteer numbers. Uh, present day, as you see there, we have uh, 14 at West Ridge with three <coughs> probationary, 11 at Mono East with seven, and 13 with one. So what's probationary? Probationary means that that individual uh, has an interest in the fire service, but has yet to pass uh, the course is needed to become a full-fledged certified firefighter. Uh, do you mean uh, three additional pro probationary in addition to the 14? We'll do in addition to, sir, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so, Chief, uh, you mentioned your incidents take place uh, real late in the evening uh, from your pre 
previous slides. Uh, the volunteers, do they attend, uh, you know, at the one o'clock emergencies uh, as much as they, they would in the daytime? Sure, so you'll see a little bit further down, I'm starting to um, reflect on, on what their incident response is like. Um, we've only recently been able to do this because of the way that we're assigning calls now in the CAD. It varies. It, it varies from uh, some are available more at night than they are during the day, depending on the shift they work. Some are available just the opposite. Uh, but all in all, I, I have broken down for you there how often they actually are, are able to assemble to respond to a call. So, for example, West Ridge is able to respond 51% of the time that they were dispatched. Northeast 65, Amano East 61. So we have a system built around um, <coughs> volunteers responding to, to incidents and that system has always been there. But just something we have to keep in mind is that as those numbers continue to decline and our service continues to increase, we've got to find some way of making up for those lack of responses. So those, uh, those three numbers, 14, 11, and 13, they, they add up to, uh, to the 38 qualified? Correct. 49 uh, includes the probationary. And you say of 105, that's just, that would be uh, some sort of volunteer goal? Sure, so the, the departments were built, the stations were built around the capacity for 35 at each station. And that's, at one time, we had a waiting list beyond that 35. This isn't anything uh, specific to North Haven. As I talked about last year, and I provided news articles for, this is something that we're facing throughout the entire state and nation. Um, we're continuing to try to address it, but <coughs> these are the real numbers. <clears throat> so the way I have this set up uh, for a presentation is I wanted to provide this, this very brief background, much less than I have in the past, and start to kind of cover the, the specific increases that were asked for. The start with operational budget increases. So this line is asked to uh, increase by $10,000. This is the OSHA safety mandates line. What this line is, is it is our third party independent testing that is required to uh, come in every year and conduct the various tests on the equipment listed there. So for fire hose, it means laying out every length of fire hose that we have in our department and testing it. Uh, testing it to capacity to make sure it can withstand pressure so it's not breaking on fire scenes potentially uh, compromising the suppression efforts and injuring members. Ground ladders get tested every single year, all of our ground ladders. They get weight tested, they get looked at very closely to make sure that there's uh, no areas of failure on them. All of our life safety ropes have to be tested constantly and, and <coughs> maintained and recorded. The self-contained breathing apparatus, which is what SCBA is, the regulator is what we actually breathe from that, that regulates our breathing, needs to be tested and flow tested every year. The cylinders themselves have to be hydrostatically tested. And then even the extrication equipment, from battery operated to hydraulic equipment, the blades need to be inspected, the lines need to be inspected, the batteries have to be inspected, and the uh, capacity for which that tool operates. So if you look at the PSI that that tool necessarily forces open or cuts metal, that needs to be tested every year to make sure that it's within the, uh, the identified manufacturer specs. Those are all testing that's done by third party um, people that are called in. And for good reason, we want to have that independent record keeping uh, so that we can, we can rely on that. The historical line funding for this is that the last time this was increased was uh, budget year 1718. So it's been at this level for the last three years. So you have quotes now to say that it's going to go up? We do, and it's something that it's, uh, we're currently trying to use to cover with other lines, but it really should come out of just this line. Say that one more time, please. So if, if, if the expense exceeds what I have here in the budget, then I'll have to pull from the equipment oh, yeah. line or I'll have to do something yeah. else. So really, all in all, all those expenses should be coming out of the OSHA okay, safety mandate see. lines. Yes, thank you. So, <clears throat> so it's, it's not just testing, it's ultimately replacement? If necessary? No. It's no. just testing. No. Just, just the testing. Okay. Moving forward with operational budget line increases, I've requested that the uniform line be increased. 
Uh, this is what you see your firefighters wearing in the parade to what you uh, see them wearing when you, they respond to calls. So what's changed is there is more and more of a concerted effort right now to make sure that the clothing that firefighters are wearing when they're on duty or they're responding to calls <coughs> are not something um, that is going to make things worse in the event that they're exposed to fire. So that means things like your polyester blends and so forth. You don't want to be buying uniforms with those types of blends in them because they're not compliant. So NFPA 1975 specifically references uh, different types of uniforms which should be worn by firefighters to ensure that they're protected at all times. And with that is, is, a, is an inevitable cost. This line is put out to bid. The purchase of uniforms is put out to bid. But in order for us to continue to try to strive to purchase these uniforms we need to, uh, there's an associated cost with that. Um, I mean, turnout gear is turnout gear. So you're talking just the uniforms, uniforms themselves, like I'm wearing right now. Yep. But they don't wear uniforms to a fire to turn out gears over it. So sure. is it more for medical? No, it's it's actually both. It's fire as well because in the event that you actually are uh, in a high heat environment, your clothing can actually start to degrade and, and, and compensate. I, I think what what Rich is asking is that when they're when they're on duty right mm -hmm. they're not dressed in their uniforms are they they're dressed in their their turnout gear right well, they actually no, dress no, they hit the turnout yeah. gear once you hit the engine right but yeah but what are they wearing <clears throat> before that right yeah they're wearing uniform like I am right now okay. be a little less stressed down okay yeah. Yeah. right no ties no ties no <laughs> no that would be uncomfortable all day and I don't see that line on here am I missing that where is that item yeah I didn't no there's a uniform on uh, no there's a uniform cleaning, cleaning. Well, where is that Paul in your budget under capital, is it? No, it's, it's, it's there. It's going from 43 to 53, correct? Correct. Right. Uniform cleaning allowance. Uh, Mine says 43 to 43. Yeah. yeah. Weren't you always purchasing uh, these uniforms Which in the past uh, to this? Oh, it's over <coughs> No, sir. No, this is, this is, um, it's over in the this is newer mm -hmm. science and research and data that's coming out that's actually, uh, you can research NFPA 1975 and see the improvements that they're making based on uh, underwriter laboratories research and various other agencies that are actually identifying the uniforms as being something that should be upgraded to make sure that they're protection for firefighters. So it's not something we've always been buying, though. Hmm. Okay. No. Moving forward, operational increases, the medical supplies line item I've asked <coughs> to uh, be increased. The last time this line was increased, it's worth mentioning, was in 1718 again. It went from 29 to 39. What that increase accounted for at that time was we converted to a EPCR program, electronic patient care reports. So up until that time, we were <coughs> providing patient care and we were keeping everything on handwritten paper run forms. And that presents a number of issues with it because the paper run forms aren't, aren't necessarily ready when the patient delivered to the hospital. And there's very few ways of pulling data and tracking and billing and so forth. So that line was increased at that time for us to um, purchase that software, implement it, purchase modems. The modems actually connect to the light packs themselves, which is a heart monitor you see a paramedic bring into the call. Those modems upload the entire uh, cardiac rhythm and vital signs into a cloud, into a program. So that line increase at that time, the majority of it covered the, the increase of the modems and the increase of the software. So there really hasn't been an increase in this line to compensate for the <coughs> increase in medical costs in a number of years. Uh, I tracked it back to 1415. As you know, just by staying in touch with the news, the cost of medical uh, prescriptions and so forth continue to increase, and it's something that, that we just need to make sure that we have available to us. Uh, our paramedics and our EMTs operate underneath standing orders for the most part from medical control and the docs are out of Yale Hospital. We don't have a lot of control over which medications we carry. We can't choose to carry some and not others. They specifically give us the medications we need to carry and how we need to treat patients based on those medications. And they are looking at increasing um, what we have to carry. They're also looking at changing around some of the medications that we have and because of that there's an increased cost. A quick example I'll give you is Narcan. 
As recently as 2016, Narcan was free. It's currently $85 a dose. There are some patients we respond to that need multiple doses of Narcan in order to revive them. So the medical cost uh, for us is continuing to be a concern and it's something that we've asked for to increase so that I can continue to outfit our paramedics and EMTs with the medications and the EMS supplies they need to operate. We're going to get into, uh, again, this is still operational budget line increases. So the overtime line, I'm looking for a 5% increase in the overtime line from where it is current day. That just simply compensates for the wage increase of 2.5% the last two years. As you may recall, the overtime line is used. That's if, if there's any discretionary overtime, that's what it is. That is for covering things like a blizzard is coming, there's an ice storm coming, there's a hurricane coming, and I need to put on extra units to be able to respond to an anticipated increased level of calls, or in some cases, um, call back for fires that are occurring in town in which I need to call back additional units to take care of additional calls that may be coming in while we're all tied up. So again, that line is only increasing by the differential of the wage increase for the last two years. It was not adjusted last year. You're, you're saying that the full time line, the 8% uh, the increase, 5% uh, of it accounts for two years worth of contract increases. Is that correct? I'm saying the overtime line right now. The overtime. Correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Eventually, I'm going to ask about the, just the regular full time line. Yep. We're getting there. Yeah. I promise. The contractual budget line increases. So, again, these are contractual. So, this is not something that I can control. This is identified in the contract. <coughs> and as such is something that I need to budget for. So this is something that we separated out a couple of fiscal years ago. We separated overtime from contractual replacement staffing line. Mm -hmm. Again, this is not discretionary. This is, I need to cover the, sh the, uh, the firefighters while they're on shift in the event of a vacation day, personal day, et cetera. What's happened since the last time we, had, we created this line is again, a 5% increase in the last two years, two and a half and two and a half. But more specifically, what was a driving reason behind this was at the time of fiscal year 1819, there were 734 contractual days off that were accrued by the staff, by the career staff. And I remember passing out information to all of you that kind of showed how vacation days based on seniority and so forth. Present day, that number has increased to 812 contractual days off for a difference of 78. And that's what's driving that number up is the uh, career department, the labor force, has increased seniority and as such has increased in some vacation time and I need to be able to plan for that. Now, what I would like to point out is I do anticipate this line to stabilize in the near future. I don't want you to think this is something that two years from now is going to be another $90,000. I don't believe that's going to happen. What I do anticipate happening in the next couple of years is I do anticipate three to five retirements. <coughs> Those are the most senior employees that we have that therefore um, are available to them the, the highest number of vacation days. As those senior members begin to retire, that number of contractual days off is going to drop. So I, I do think that we're getting to a point right now, at least for the next several years, with this increase in place, that it's going to somewhat stabilize. But I just wanted to make sure that the <coughs> Board of Finance realizes what's driving this, this number. Just a quick question. Mm -hmm. So the, if, if you could please just distinguish between vacation days, personal days, bereavement days, and union negotiation days, what category do each of those fall under? These are, so this is the, the reason for the increase is the vacation and personal days. So those are two different things. Correct. But they're essentially used the same way. It's just, for an example, what happens is there's so many members that are allowed off on a shift at one time mm -hmm. on vacation. Right. But there may be uh, one member that's allowed to take a personal day. That's all. It's semantics. It's basically the same exact thing. It's just a matter of you get two personal days and so many vacation days. And your personal days are a little bit more valuable because you don't have to worry about there being as many people out and you can still take a day off. Mm. But they're the same thing. And a certain number of sick days as well. Correct. That, so that, all yep, that's taken and care that's of And that's all under days. contractual replacement staffing. That's correct. All of it. Okay. So they can carry their vacation days over year to year? No, sir. 
they cannot. No, if, if I said something that, that misled you, I apologize. All I'm saying is that they, you have X number of vacation days and X number of personal days. Um, on a shift, let's say there's three firefighters are allowed to be off on vacation. And once those three are hit, no more vacation days can be put in. But if I had a personal day, I may still be able to put a personal day in because it, the personal days carry a little more weight. But they're the same exact thing, essentially. It's just a matter of how we, how we prioritize who gets what. Okay. And Chief, obviously this line has also grown because you've added the staff, correct? It has, but not by very much. So to give you an example, a career firefighter um, with the most time on uh, receives 30 vacation days. Mm -hmm. A new firefighter receives six. So for a senior firefighter to retire, I can hire five new firefighters and make up for that. Right. So there's a very small increase because of that. The new firefighters have not contributed to this number right. very much at all. And again, moving forward, which is why I expect it to stabilize, as the senior members begin to retire, we'll be able to make up those, those numbers quite easily. So how many years does it take to get 30 days? It's in the contract. I want to say it's uh, 15 to 18 years or so. It's a long time. Hmm. 15. 15. When a new firefighter is in their first year on the job during that probationary period, mm -hmm. can they still participate in this contractual replacement? Can participate how? They, they, uh, Meaning, can they take the place of a more senior firefighter mm -hmm. that... Of course. Cool. I'm just wondering, during that one, sure. year, one year? Yes. They can? Okay. Yep. Just checking. Okay. <clears throat> Moving forward to personnel increase. So, as you may recall, through prior uh, budget years, we currently are able to staff two of the four ships with 10 firefighters. I'm requesting two additional firefighters to be able to staff a third of four ships with 10 firefighters. What this is allowing for is a second engine to be operated and a second paramedic to be operated on duty. And as you may recall from prior presentations, we only staff, when we have eight firefighters on duty, we only staff the one engine. So there's one apparatus with water. And I'd ask you to reflect back on how many times I said the volunteers are not responding. So there are times that we have no water going to a scene. And that's alarming to me, that's concerning to me. Which is one of the reasons why we've positioned our staff increase to focus around two things. Bringing a second paramedic on duty and making sure that we have water for fire suppression. The paramedic is operating the same exact way on the engine as he or she would on a rescue. Nothing changes. The same equipment is brought to the scene, the same skill set is brought to the scene. But what we're able to do right now is staff a second engine and provide a second paramedic. And so with these two additional firefighters, we're um, moving forward with a gradual growth in the department and this will allow us to <coughs> staff a third of four shifts <coughs> and 10 firefighters. And the second engine has just two men on it? Three. Three men on mm -hmm. it. Yep, we've reassigned uh, a firefighter from headquarters, so that's a three-man engine. Right. So instead of one with four, you have th two with two three. Two with three. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, it, can you email this, this presentation sure. to us? Or? Yeah, it's good to ask to see. Mm -hmm. Continue, Chief. Okay. Moving forward to capital requests. So again, I have this set up now to cover capital requests for the department. And these are the uh, various capital requests that you'll see, some of which I'll, I'll cover, some of which I won't. For example, the ladder truck lease and the SUG lease. Yeah, I apologize. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Can we, one more second. Let's sure. go back to your operational budget. Yeah. <clears throat> you, right. you have, one of the items you have here is holidays. Contractual, yeah. An increase by 23%. Yeah, that's a line that was getting uh, overspent, I believe, in the past, and it's, uh, it's something that hasn't been adjusted in a long time. That was a, that was a late addition um, based on, on uh, what was provided to Ed Swinkowski. So again, that's, that's vacations, um, holidays is a driving force. So as wages increase, the premium that firefighters are paid for working the holiday, the premium that they're paid for the holiday itself has increased. And that's something that should have been increasing all along, and it just it's because it's tied directly to wage increases. Can you send us an excerpt from their contract to at least give us an idea? Sure. What it is, as well as your, your longevity. Again, contractual. Yep. Yep. 
Yeah, well, that's a 49% increase. Is pretty the final longevity. Yep. Longevity is uh, the contract allows for uh, a few hundred hours. It ranges from, I believe, two to like 500 hours or so in um, you know, annual stipend for longevity based on years of service. And again, with a senior workforce that's accruing more vacation days, they're also accruing a higher longevity stipend. And the EMT is the stipend? Correct. Same thing, contractual. Okay. Yeah. Um, we go to. Uh, no, not yet. No, no, yeah. no. What about this consultant line? Sorry, the contracted fire marshal consultant. Sure. Fifty thousand. Mm -hmm. That wasn't asked to be increased, though. Or it says zero for last year. Yeah. It, that was the one I left it was out. Left right. out. He left it out. He had it. Right. I, actually, that, that's a question that I have for Ed about that. Oh, right. That was the one that yep, you had yeah. the right total, but the line wasn't there. It so, didn't add into the total. It was on the line, but the formula didn't include it in the formula. Right, but so we, under estimated expenditures, we are expending money on this. Yes. So in that third column, shouldn't we actually reflect what the forty-four thousand dollars that we spent so far and the hundred and fifty we expect to spend this year? Correct. But what I do is with that estimated column, I just carry over the budget mm -hmm. because there's five hundred forty lines. And I couldn't give you an accurate estimate on all those. So really, I'm just carrying over what's in the budget. But we're we're expecting to spend one hundred fifty thousand dollars. Sure. That right? I put yeah. that in there. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Chief. Okay, just one quick question mm -hmm. for the Chief, again, regarding uh, personnel. Mm -hmm. uh, so part-time has been eliminated? Uh, yes. That okay. was part-time clerical, I believe, it, as it uh, appeared. It's just the second, yeah. second row part <clears throat> personnel part-time was, was eliminated apparently this year and is continuing to be excluded. And then uh, full-time, I just did a couple of calculations. If you look at budgeted 1819 to 1920, that's an increase of 23 percent. If you look at actual 1819 to 1920, it's about 21 percent. And now we're talking about going from 1920 to 2021 <coughs> of another 8 percent. So even with retroactive pay as a result of the CBA, I, I'm still kind of struggling with some of these gigantic numbers. Sure, that's not a line that I prepared. That's a line that, that Mr. Tomkowski prepares. The full-time line. Mm -hmm. I, I'm just tr trying to understand sure. how contractually we can have, in two consecutive years, an increase of over 20% and then another increase of another 8% when we've had Fair well, you minimum. added two men yeah, last year. There's extra bodies in there. Right? Sure, but and they're coming in at the lowest level of the totem pole, so I'm True. trying to understand. Right, but there's two and a half percent on everybody else, plus the, the two new people, plus two people for this year for half a year, correct? Yeah, but I mean, we're talking about, you know, three and a half million dollars here just for this one line item. So so it's, it's not small amounts of money. These, these are big changes, and I'm just still trying to struggle and trying to understand exactly how contractually that can be possible. Ed, is there a way that you could bridge for us, say, the 2018-19 <coughs> actual to mm -hmm. this 2021? Maybe start there and show us the, the couple of changes and get us to this 3 million three fifty nine number? Yeah. That would be great. Thank yeah, you. But Thank you so and much. Again, it, it, it makes sense. It's right. <coughs> they're increased plus the additional personnel. Mm -hmm. <coughs> okay, Chief. Sure. So, Moving forward, a capital request. Excuse me. Go yep. back one screen. <clears throat> sure. Uh, yep. Uh, Nancy, you can see here just two firefighters on the screen here. You're talking a quarter of a million. So, I mean, that in itself should justify some of the step. So, uh, that'd take a little. No, I'm no, that's a total increase, right? That's a total increase that's, for the yeah, year. Right. That's the total increase for the year. Right. But it's two men, but but if you're going back to uh, 2018, That's two men plus this the is the incremental. The this, this is justified. Twenty three percent. It'll get us a sheet. Yeah, and I'm I'll sure work with that to make sure and that. And plus, we're in the prior year, 140,000 was under safety yep. issues. We moved it to the over. They were in different so lines. Another at the line too. You got to back into you actual. Realize that. Well, yeah. then that should have decreased, right? <laughs> if it wasn't coming out of this department. No, but now it's going into it. That's why there's such a jump. Right, but I'm, I'm saying in the year that it wasn't in the department, it went up by 23%, and now it's going up another 8%. So $140,000 is not going to be even It'll increase, increase that actual by 140000 which right. will decrease the overall increase. 
Ed will give you a sheet so you can follow it. That would be good. Yeah. Capital chief. Capital. Thank you, chief. Sir, no problem. So capital, again, the only thing I'm not going to discuss are the items that have the asterisk next to them because they're a recurring obligation the town has for capital. And those were the ladder truck lease and the SCBA lease that continue. And I have it uh, noted in your five-year capital plan of, of when we anticipate that to expire, what fiscal year. <coughs> so the first capital request I wanted to go over was uh, administrative vehicle. I've asked for an administrative vehicle. This is my fifth year in a row asking for an admin vehicle. We cannot add to the fleet without a, an approval from the Board of Finance for capital. So we've been able uh, to keep things moving forward. But for example, the police department gave us a car uh, a number of years ago now, and it's a 2011 Crown Victoria retired police car with 110,000 miles on it. And I've asked for this to be replaced. It's becoming unreliable. It's not reliable in the snow. And because the three chief officers, one of us or two of us, depending on what's going on, are on call at any given time, we need to have a spare car available in the event that we have a mechanical failure or we have something going on with our cars. So we have to end up going into a retired police cruiser and put our families in that. So all I'm asking for is the uh, ability to replace that admin vehicle so that we can begin <coughs> to uh, have some, some redundancy you know, what we have for vehicles available to us. We have no spare cars. The next capital request I have is for a life pack 15. Uh, it's what's pictured there. I referenced it earlier. This is what that modem attaches to that uploads all of the patient information into the cloud for our data management for EMS calls. And it does everything from cardiac rhythms to check in your SpO2 levels to check in waveform capno to check in your heart rate. Um, it'll actually cardio convert you. It'll actually pace your heart. Um, it does a number of things, and it's a very expensive machine. <clears throat> We've purchased three over the years, and it wasn't really a concern because we had essentially one paramedic operating. Well, with two shifts now operating with two paramedics, this is something that we need to begin to look to replace. In the years that we've purchased, they have been a 2009, 11, and 15. The service life on these is eight years. So again, wasn't too much of a concern up until now because if one failed, I had a second, and we we're only running one active paramedic. With two active paramedics now, um, I want to make sure that if one of these fails, I have a spare, I have a reserve, and the 11-year-old one should probably come out of service. I mean, this is something that you're saving people's lives with. You want to make sure it works and it's available to you. And the $40,000 uh, will cover the purchase of one of those machines. The older machines, Chief, are they discarded or are they retrofitted to new? Can you turn them in for a credit? Sometimes you can get a credit. Sometimes it, it really depends on the manufacturer and how much they're really trying to sell the next new one. So I don't want to make any commitments of the fact that we might be able to sell the old one and get a credit for it, because it really kind of depends on, on what's taking place at the manufacturer level. Uh, there are sometimes some value to them, but you know, there's also some value in making sure that if you keep the software update, you can convert it over into a training machine as well. And now you're not actually using something that you have to use in a real person, you're using it in training. Um, and that's very beneficial to our staff. Okay. I want to cover, as I have in the past, the age of our fleet, and this is covering specifically the engine and the pumpers in our fleet. We've talked about this in the past, and, and this is going to segue into my next request. I just want to point out the age of our, of our apparatus, the fact that we have gone eight years at a time before without purchasing an engine, and that's not a reflection on this current board, it's just how things were previously done. But we have an older fleet. As you can see, three of those engines are over 25 years old. Now, a lot of people think that seven engines is a lot for a town of North Haven. Seven engines is not a lot of engines. Seven engines gets us by. I want you to think about the fact that when there's a house fire taking place, four of those engines need to be there. Now, all four pumping water necessarily? No, but all four bringing equipment and air packs specifically to the scene so that we can have firefighters on scene and operating safely and effectively. So imagine right now we have one engine that's completely out of service, been out of service since June 9th, 2019, because it was struck on a highway. So that leaves us with six. 
I need to have one at each each station, without a doubt, at least one. The last thing I want to do is have a fire station staff, not staff, with any apparatus in it to begin to uh, get to a fire. That's the reason those stations are positioned where they are geographically. So I'm currently down one, which leaves me with six. Trying to balance a fleet with three of them that are over 25 years old becomes very <clears throat> problematic for me. These are maintenance hogs. They, as they begin to age, it's harder and harder to find parts. As it's harder to find parts, this apparatus is out of service even longer periods of time. So I'll go sometimes three, four weeks without an engine because it's at the shop waiting to get fixed. They're waiting to get parts because it's that old. What is the status of Engine 2's repair? Engine 2 I expect back sometime uh, within the next 30 days. It's currently being painted and I received pictures as recently as this week and I'm being told it should be within the next 30 days. <clears throat> so again, when Engine 2 was hitting Ohio, it really put us in a situation where we were already stressed. And what this does is when I'm trying to only have one engine out of service at a time because I need to have the others available for the fires and for the, the other calls that are occurring. I don't have a lot of depth there either. So what I'm looking to do is begin, and, and it's worth noting here as well, um, Engine 8 right now, I expect to take that out of service in spring of 2020 when the next engine arrives. As you may remember, there was an appropriation about a taxpayers uh, sometime last year. And that engine is currently being built, and I have highlighted what I intend to have it replace. Now, why aren't I replacing the oldest engine? I'm hoping to have one more year available to me to be able to put in for a grant. The grants are very, very competitive. Apparatus grants specifically are the most competitive grants that any department could put in for. 60 to 65 percent of all the grants that are submitted to FEMA for, through the Assistance to Firefighters grant are for apparatus. That's how competitive they are. One of the things that keeps us competitive in that arena is by the overall age of the fleet being a high average. So my, and he, not only that, but also looking to replace an old engine. So what, I'm going to position a grant once again to try to replace the 33-year-old engine because it gives us the best narrative in that grant application. And to be honest with you, the 33-year-old engine is actually in better shape than a 29-year-old engine. It just comes down to, to make and model and so forth. So what type of apparatus are you looking for for the 300? So as you'll see, I'm looking for the 300 to become an annual recurring expense for capital. We've talked before about an apparatus replacement plan, and what I'm hoping to do is begin to put that amount of money aside so that we can begin to buy apparatus as we get to a point where we need to buy them. We're a little behind here. We've got apparatus that are over 25 years old, and what I'm hoping to do is uh, build this out for the future so that there is money being accrued that as we get to a point we need to have apparatus replaced, we have the funding there to do so. We're not going to the taxpayers with an emergency declaration uh, for apparatus. We're not waiting a year for it to get built and we're not buying a demo. We have it planned, we can plan around it, we can, we can uh, do a series of things to ensure that we have the apparatus that we need. This is perhaps something that should have been done a while ago, and, but this is something that I believe is probably best for the future moving forward. It's also going to, in the future, play a significant role in decreasing our repair costs, which is what I'm gonna show you next. Not only is the operational impact to us great because we're balancing this this aging fleet and trying to make sure that we have enough in service at any given time we're also paying a lot of money towards <coughs> maintenance of this fleet because it's so old so what i have here and i can certainly provide to you and you'll see when i provide the uh <coughs> handouts to you is this is apparatus repair costs since 2014 broken down by engine broken down by calendar year, not fiscal year, because we keep track of things on a calendar year in, in this particular data management system that we have. So as you can see, the older engines, um, they're quite costly to maintain. And so we'll, I mean, for example, um, engine one is not a good example because engine one was a demo engine and we had to do a number of things to it once we purchased it. So engine one is kind of the outlier in this. Engine two, which is what was struck on a highway, that does not cover uh, the current work being done to it present day. So that's going to go up. Do we um, have an idea bit. what that's going to cost? 
I did. It was in the. Uh, I got to figure out what the insurance is going to pay. It's. Uh, but we did agree to to spend. I want to say in the neighborhood of uh, ten to fifteen thousand dollars. Because while everything was apart and being worked on, it made the most sense for us to spend that money to get the work done it needed to get done. Because it is a two thousand and four. So it saved us money in the, in the long run. Because while everything's apart, it's easy to get to. Um, but there is going to be an additional cost. But you can see, we, we spent a lot of money. I mean, look at Engine 8, which is the engine I've identified as what I want to replace um, when the new one arrives in the spring. Over the, Since 2014, we've spent $47,000 in, in maintaining that, <coughs> repairing it. And something to keep in mind is, is we don't have a mechanic in our department. We don't have a mechanic in a town that can work on the engine. So when we send these engines out, they're going to our uh, contracted bidder, and they're being worked on. But... So was a lot of the departments. You know, we, he does the best he can to service us when we bring things there, but some things are out of his control either. So I'm constantly trying to struggle with the, the downtime of apparatus and ensuring that we have enough, at least we have four engines at any given time. And I've come close to not having four engines. I've come very close this past summer to having to actually shut down a fire station because we don't have apparatus available. So I think it's important that we start to plan for the gradual replacement of apparatus. Now, I've asked for 300. You'll see in the five-year plan in a couple years from now, I've increased that to four. I've increased it to four at the same time that a big expense <coughs> drops off, I believe, was the, uh, the ladder truck lease, so that the capital stays basically the same funded throughout the next five years. Perhaps 10 years from now, when none of us are probably in this position any longer, um, we can come down from that number as the apparatus becomes newer. But right now, this is what I need to start to do to, uh, to improve the fleet. So, so Chief, what, what, like a $4,000, or just random, any year, three, four grand, what, what would they be doing for $4,000? Sure, so it's, remember that every year we have to send this apparatus out for DOT and pump service testing. That's what's testing. It's, it's testing and then whatever they find wrong through the testing. So it could be brakes, tires, lighting, scene lighting, mm -hmm. uh, pump replacements, pump, pump repairs more so, all the valves and the inner workings of the pump itself. Now, was there a grace period if you buy a new, new equipment? There's no testing involved? Yeah, you know, we've actually been able to build into the, um, the ladder truck purchase, in fact, uh, a couple of years in which the testing was going to be free. The service was going to be was built into that cost. Hmm. So we started to frame our purchases um, so that we can try to get ahead of this a little bit. Yeah. Yep. There's always some disclaimers in sure. terms of what's covered and what's not. But to the best of our ability, we try to incorporate that into the original purchase. Great. Okay. So <clears throat> you made a comment that you might have had to shut a firehouse down. So what if you actually did have to do that? Do you have to call another town for help? And now, so do we have to pay them for their help, or how would that all work? You know, it really kind of depends on when that would happen, what time of year, what the hazards are for that time of year. But. I don't want to say which station would have been shut down. I don't know no, I'm anybody, not asking that. But, I'm not, yeah, I'm asking but we what have the plans situation. in place. Yeah, we had had plans in place to, to cover through mutual aid, to perhaps bring on additional career staff for those periods of time to make sure that we get an engine out there. I mean, at least you've got an engine started, right? When it's coming from another part of town, at least it's starting that direction. Um, but it's a, it's a problem. So do we? So if we get help from another town, do we have to compensate them for them coming to our no, aid or no? No. no. Okay. But they expect us to uh, right. They right expect us yeah. to reciprocate. But if we can't reciprocate, right? I and guess. that's exactly what our our, our position yeah. has been for okay, a long no, time. No, I just I didn't know how that worked. Yeah, I just thought it was important to just emphasize the fact that people seem to think that seven engines is a lot, and it's really not. It's just getting us by. Particularly if we had seven new engines that they were always in service. Yeah, that that would be sufficient. But we're not we're not there right now. Well, I, I would say with the media and every time I get an alert on the phone, I'm like, really, North Haven? We just had one yesterday. Like, I'm seeing all the yeah. alerts. Mm -hmm. And I've noticed busy. that maybe it's because they alert. I have all the traffic alerts. It's, it's a lot. Mm -hmm. And I've, there was a couple of times there were like two within a few hours, which means if you're out on the highway and other stuff's going on, it, I, that's definitely a challenge. Sure. Chief, just one quick question. Mm -hmm. um, when uh, the new uh, engine comes in in, I, I think you said April, the average age 
of the engine fleet mm. will be substantially less, right? right? So Correct. it'll be about 15 years on mm -hmm. average, something like that. Yeah, I think right now it's about 17, 18. Yeah. Right, mm -hmm. so it'll drop down to 15. Mm -hmm. So The grant application, mm -hmm. fortunately, is due before April. Mm. When exactly, I don't know. It's usually been open already by now, right. but I expect it to be open any day. I don't really know what the delay is in the federal government at this point. Right. But I would. it's never been that late before April. Right. So I'm hoping to be able to get that grant submitted before we take delivery so that we put forth an honest uh, grant submission. And and that's why you're you're keeping the oldest one so that it makes the most compelling argument. That's correct. That it, okay. And regarding the the ladder trucks, mm -hmm. obviously we have the the brand new 1.2 million dollar one, and then uh, we're looking to I assume replace the 18 year old one when you get the the one that you're going to get used for 300 thousand or in what is this current year? fiscal year, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. And have you secured that or not yet? You actually should be able to see a bid go out uh, likely this week or next. So it was. It was a, a tall task to be able to find what we we're looking for at the price we were looking for. Uh, I was fortunate enough to, and, and I'll credit the vendor when it's when it's the sale was done. But the the vendor was fortunate enough to be able to find an apparatus. I actually uh, made a site visit to Ohio last week and put hands on it and mm -hmm. witnessed the testing, and it looks like it's something that will work for us. And we're preparing some bid documents now, so I expect that to replace this fiscal. And this year. will go to one of the volunteer fire. This will replace the truck, the 18-year truck that you're mentioning, that's mm -hmm. currently, uh, in fact, as of two weeks ago, it's currently, the area was out of service on it. As we'd expected, that's the reason it was replaced. Mm -hmm. uh, the area was completely out of service. It no longer works. Mm -hmm. So it's going to replace there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's in Northeast. Mm -hmm. Yes. At Northeast. All right. Good job, Mike. Okay. I go to an establishment across the street so I can look through the window. <laughs> <laughs> a regular. <laughs> station security? Station security. <laughs> We've funded station security, which has allowed us to proceed with uh, CCTV monitoring and access control and integration with headquarters monitoring for the last two years. This $20,000 capital for this year would allow us to move forward with a third of four stations. Uh, we have had histories of, of various issues taking place in or around the firehouse. We had a, at least two break-ins in one of them. It's something that we just uh, we need to be mindful of and continue to try, try to protect the fire station and the assets that are inside. And so that's just an ongoing effort to try to uh, increase that capital so we can get the third of four stations complete. <clears throat> Within capital, I've also requested a station generator. Two of our four stations currently have standby generators. Two of them do not. So what does that mean for us? Besides the obvious, think about now in terms of a firehouse. So typically when the power goes out, not always, but there's usually something, an event taking place in that area that the fire department is responding to, whether it be a, a transformer exploded, a car into a pole, et cetera. Those firefighters now respond to that nearest station and can't get in with their access control necessarily. The batteries have a very short life on them. The lights are dark. If it's a nighttime call, the lights are dark now. Now they're trying to open the door manually to be able to respond to that call, which takes some time, takes some effort, and make sure that more than one's there now to be able to get things ready. It also affects our, our CAD software. So what I want you to think about is in, in Every single firehouse right now, I have television monitors in between the bays. And that television monitor alerts when there's a call for that station. It allows the visual reinforcement of what the call is, where it is, what the cross streets are. And in some cases, in some of the stations, it actually goes as far as letting you know which volunteers are responding. We have an app in place right now so that when a call takes place, volunteers on their phones can actually indicate if they're responding or not responding. And that allows those who are at the station to know how many they should anticipate to arrive. All that goes blank. All of it goes dark. And so it really removes a lot of the, the enhanced operations that we have as a department that we're trying to improve upon when we don't have a generator to station. Uh, both of these stations currently have a generator of some capacity on wheels. I think one of them is a very, very old military generator that they plug in into the station directly but again that takes time and uh and a lot of effort to to get going again and we should have station <coughs> standby generators in all of our stations that's my feeling so chief this, uh, is this one or two this talks about northeast so is, is, yeah. it, is this one or two generators this should be for one generator just for northeast mm -hmm. so and then one other station that still would not have that that's correct yeah mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so that covers um, the, the, what I hope to be the, uh, the consultant line, the, the transfer switch, and so forth. I thought we uh, put a pad in the back for a generator at Northeast. That was Mono East. Mono East. And Mono East is the second station with the generator. That, that, that has the generator. Okay. Correct. Mono East and headquarters both have generators. Okay. Mm -hmm. But there was a pad there uh, in preparation <coughs> for the generator to be installed. Yes. Yep. Okay. So again, last year I had asked for uh, a generator for headquarters because it's currently undersized. And I'm just trying to make these slow, gradual uh, repairs and, and identify deficiencies that I move forward to be able to just kind of plug the holes that we identify. So how do I see the future? <laughs> I think we need to continue with the gradual increase of career staffing. The new norm for us is that the volunteer numbers that we presently see today are likely not to increase by very much. I expect them to stabilize. I don't see a huge decline coming. Uh, we continue. I've been trending it for the last few years, and it looks like we're staying consistent with where we are. But with that, we have economic growth. And we have an increase in call volume. So I'm looking to continue with the gradual increase <coughs> of career staff, looking to ensure that we have an apparatus replacement plan in place so that we can keep the integrity of the fleet in place and, and reliability there. Uh, the fire station hardening, which we're doing through station security and through the generators. But this all assumes that the, uh, the call volume continues to rise at the, the level that we anticipate, you know, a little bit every year that it's currently doing. Uh, this assumes economic growth continues, which there's uh, all indicators are that it will. And again, the volunteers stay the same. And that's what I have for you. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Chief. Board members have questions beyond what we've already asked during the presentation? Yeah, I have a question, and I've asked this a couple times, but I'm going to ask you again. And it mainly has to do with the revenue line, revenue line item on the pair, the pair for the paramedic services. Sure. I think I asked you this before, but seeing that the budget number is 170,000, and looking at the actuals, what are, what is your thought on that number? It's a great question. <laughs> Here's the. Um, Here's a history on that. So when that was, uh, when those numbers were projected, it was through an independent consultant that was hired um, and in conjunction with myself. At that time, fiscal year 16, 17, we were providing 310 intercepts, paramedic assisted transports to the area hospitals, 310. Fiscal year 17, 18, it was 296. At about that time is when, um, through conversations with the first Flackman and I, and, and identifying some of the things that were taking place in town, we decided to pursue the, the PSA through the state of Connecticut. We began to devise an EMS plan in 2018 that identified exactly how we wanted EMS response and ambulance response in the town of North Haven. Um, that raised some eyebrows and, and kind of got some suspicions up on behalf of some of the ambulance <coughs> providers. So we went from fiscal year 17, 18 of 296 intercepts to fiscal year 18, 19, where we had 183. So this is kind of the reason why those numbers are down. The, the ambulance companies uh, changed their, their response. They, anticipation of the PSA uh, legal argument, they began to completely change around the way that they were staffing <coughs> and providing EMS to the town of North Haven. As recently as fiscal year 1920, those numbers dropped to 74. So this is kind of the ebb and the flow of, of what's taken place. We knew well that once we decided to pursue the PSA that this would change. As I sit here before you today, I'm, I'm happy to announce that as of this past uh, Monday, we were notified that the preliminary ruling on the PSA hearing is that the town of North Haven has been awarded the PSA. It's preliminary. It's subject to an appeal process still, and it's subject to the Commissioner of Public Health endorsing the, uh, the preliminary decision. So moving forward, uh, we're going to have the opportunity to determine what exactly that line is going to look like in the future. It's very premature for me to discuss what that's going to be right now. This just happened this past week, and we need to sit down with a, a number of people to kind of figure out what EMS in North Haven is going to look like in the future. So that line is going to, at the very least, be able to be precisely identified in terms of revenue, because we have uh, 
hopefully pending this moving forward, <coughs> we're going to have exclusive control over EMS in North Haven, which we have not had before. But the reason that number is down is because when we pursue in the PSA, they, they try to get ahead of it. Chief, I always thought that that line included the, our ability to bill for uh, consumables we use during a call. Is that right? No, you can't bill for consumables unless you actually go as far as treating the patient through, um, through the hospital. Now, what we're going to do is, for example, the medical supplies, what we're going to do with the contracted provider that we, we end up with for, for EMS is we're going to make sure that whatever equipment that we use, we get it replaced from the ambulance that's there because they're the ones that can bill for it. But if, if we pro, uh, provide EMS on scene and we don't have any part in transport, we mm -hmm. don't collect any revenue back on the EMS right. equipment that was used. Right. We could also make a very good argument um, that with Scott in that position, that's allowed DJ to do the plan reviews to increase the revenue even more that we're seeing on the fire plan review revenue. Without that position, that revenue might not be there, right, Chief? Yeah, I mean, if you look at what that individual has done, um, he had two roles. It was EMS and training officer. He has uh, he has overseen the EMS response in North Haven, and he has uh, he worked hard to develop the EMS plan, and to his own peril in some ways, right? Because we're all looking at what little revenue he collected, but he did it to make sure that the PSA argument was going to be intact, and that we would hopefully be successful in the end. Now we have the opportunity to discuss what that's really going to look like moving forward. But it's important to know that he serves other functions as well. We never had a training officer here, which is what we advocated for for <coughs> years. And him providing the consistency and the training to the staff is huge. And what that's going to do, hopefully, is we need to document so many training hours every year for every firefighter. So somebody has to provide that training and document it and keep the record keeping. And what we hope to do is actually continue to decrease our ISO rating, which currently sits at a, we decrease it once from a four to a three, and we're hoping to decrease it from a three to a two with this increase in the training hours that we can document and are provided for. And that's big money to the commercial establishments in North Haven that their insurance rates are based on, on that. I, I would say um, Scott has done a tremendous job in all parts of uh, his function. He is integrated volunteer and career at a level I don't think this town's ever Never. seen. Um, he's been professional as an approach. There's been a lot of value gained from his position. Not that we want to see some more money, mm -hmm. but he's gained, a, he's gained, a, he's brought a lot of value to the town and a lot of value to the department. I don't think anyone should question yeah. that. In, in moving forward now with the PSA, uh, hopefully, being uh, being the responsibility of the town of North Haven, we're going to have a lot more responsibility to ensure that that we're providing EMS based on the plan that we that we have submitted. I think also we need to take into consideration uh, Scott uh, and and, and uh, Rich. You, you mentioned the the integration of the volunteers uh, in, into the training. Uh, the the, the dollar value that the volunteers bring to the table and savings for the town um, and the, the maintenance of at least whatever the level, the total number of volunteers that we have, which has been a consistent and more enthusiasm as a result of Scott and the training program and the integration between the volunteers and the full-time firefighters. So uh, there is absolutely a financial benefit to the town that isn't taken into consideration and, and really should be. So um, he's done a marvelous job yeah. and I concur with what you're saying. No, I, I, Scott's done a lot to, um, to integrate both <coughs> career and volunteer and, and, and the enthusiasm has increased. Mm -hmm. I don't think I talked to a volunteer that uh, doesn't have a lot of respect for the guy. Sure, absolutely. And, absolutely. and to that end, uh, are there any plans as part of the integration uh, and training of both career and volunteers to actually utilize the volunteers who are also trained as EMS uh, technicians uh, to actually go out on medical calls? I think that's another problem. That's an insurance issue as well. <clears throat> The coverage that the town has and the person that oversees the town, the hospital that oversees the town's um, paramedic program, 
There's, it's not a, it's not as cut and dry as you think. No, no, no. Be. I'm just asking if there are plans. I don't to think do exactly. It that. may not be possible. Right. And there are, there are a lot of people that are volunteers in town. Mm -hmm. And if I'm speaking wrong, you can no. correct me. But there's sure. a lot of people that have the ability that are volunteers, just, just for um, legal reasons and mm -hmm. contractual reasons can't. Well, it's, it's. You're right, and that's the next step. Before we would even get to that step, the first step would have been to determine if they even have an interest in responding to medicals mm -hmm. and what that would mean mm -hmm. to their to their uh, their overall numbers. And mm -hmm. we polled all the volunteers uh, about a year and a half ago, identified for them how the EMS response would look, and they have no interest in responding to EMS calls. Mm -hmm. They are already not able to get out for about half of the fire calls. So to build a system in which volunteers respond to medical calls wouldn't really be responsible either if, if they're not necessarily reliable enough to respond to some difficulty breathing. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't want to have that, well, what if they're not going? We need to build a staff around the fact that we're able to respond to um, our call volume as we see it day to day. Mm -hmm. And when they respond, uh, volunteers respond to motor vehicle accidents that have a medical component to it, are they engaged? They can provide first aid, in yes. So just basic first aid, not Correct. EMS. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Well, I, I have a few uh, sure. questions and comments. So um, I think all of this started a couple of years ago, Paul, when, when you gave a very uh, lengthy presentation that included uh, information about data calls <coughs> and uh, was, of course, prompted by the, the August 2017 tragedy in which there was a, a fire that occurred simultaneously with a medical call and unfortunately someone passed away. Again, combined with the increased number of medical calls frequently at your monthly fire commission meeting presentations, uh, the call uh, percentage that is medical calls is 70% and uh, sometimes even higher. You know, the average that you presented was in the 60s. And then, of course, the issue of overlapping medical calls. <coughs> so for me, the real question is, are the problems that you've presented and, uh, and have detailed are they actually going to be addressed in this current fiscal coming fiscal year by your proposal? In other words, what are the taxpayers getting for the million dollar increase from last fiscal year to this fiscal year and the proposed additional half a million dollars from this year to next year um, in terms of you know what they can actually observe? Sure. So what we're looking at doing with the expansion of going to 10 <coughs> firefighters per shift is we're staffing that second engine and that mm -hmm. second paramedic to help meet that demand. And we're doing so at the Monoe station, which is allowing us to cut down our response time dramatically in an area of town that we have a very high number of calls. Mm -hmm. So the taxpayers are getting a second <coughs> ALS unit, second paramedic, and they're getting a second fire engine staffed at all times. And currently with current budget in place, two or four shifts, so 50% of the time. The proposed budget would be three quarters at a time. And you have enough paramedics to always have a paramedic assigned to Monoese? No, I've never made that claim. No, there's to always assign a Monoese? Right. Yes, I'm sorry, yes. And I thought always you have one at headquarters as well. The answer you've got to realize yeah. they probably staff three paramedics per shift right now. Right, but, he, but he's saying you'll always have a paramedic. They don't, they don't operate as a engine. paramedic. Right. But he has three <clears throat> paramedics probably on average per shift. Right. So moving. Yeah, we have enough depth. They have enough that's, depth. My, that's my question. Yeah, and we continue, in the new hires that we're going to have, uh, we continue to, to try to hire paramedics. We're, we're getting to a point where we might be able to grab, you know, at the end of the day, I look for a, a good person, right, a good firefighter. So we may grab an EMT, uh, but for the most part, it has been paramedics. I expect it to continue paramedics or maybe one or two outliers. Okay. And how many paramedics do you have now? Uh, present day, 13, 14 paramedics. 13, because it used to be nine. So this way. Yeah, again, okay. because we've been hiring you all hired, paramedics, right. it's and, a little bit higher. They went through their training. Okay. And then uh, if you get to your magical number of 40 firefighters, meaning 10 per shift, mm -hmm. um, and I've said this before, uh, and a fire call comes in, will all 10 go to that fire, and if a medical call comes in while everyone's at that fire, will two leave, will two be left behind to operate the rescue, but what will be the circumstances? Sure, so a fire, I just want to uh, uh, clarify that. So mm -hmm. a regular fire, no. A, a per, per, uh, possible house fire, yes. All 10 are going to respond. Mm 
mm -hmm. because we need to make sure that we have, you're still trying to get to that. If you go look at my workshop last year, we talked about that goal of getting 16, 18 firefighters on scene and what they're all doing when they get there in a very short amount of time. So you want all 10 to be going to a house fire with a significant <coughs> risk of injury to, to, to life. Um, so those 10 will go and mobilize for a report of a, of a building fire or a house fire. For your routine fires, all 10 are not going. In fact, all, 10 hard, all eight or 10 hardly ever go now for a fire. A, a fire, a car <coughs> fire is two engines, a career engine and a volunteer engine. Mm -hmm. uh, a, a brush fire is the same thing. So for house fires, you want to take your resources and send them to what you perceive as a highest level of risk at that point in time. If the call is de-escalated, because we always start with the highest escalation. So in other words, if somebody calls and says, I have a fire in my garage, that'll be coded as a structure fire. If the first engine gets there and says, hey, this is a small fire in a corner of the garage, uh, we can release other units. And that's what will happen. That's the, the nice thing about being able to get units on scene as fast as we can to be able to <coughs> determine what the level of resources is we have to commit. Mm -hmm. Now, in that short period of time, if the uh, medical call has taken place and we have not yet determined how long we're going to be on scene for, <coughs> then yes, the potential is there that the fire department have no resources to send to that medical call. Uh, we have to build the PSA around that, around those, those uh, possibilities of those few minutes period of time. If the units arrive on scene and realize they're going to be there for an extended period of time, then we will call in other towns to help provide for the fire and the medical response. So to answer your question, it kind of depends on, right. on a number of variables that are taking place. Right. But I, I guess I'm, I'm just <coughs> referring back to what had happened in August of 2017. Mm -hmm. What you're saying is even if we get up to 40 firefighters, if we were presented with that exact same situation, we would have that exact same outcome. No, so, at this point, we've, re we've revisited our mutual aid policies. We've ensured that we're calling in resources that can cover both fire and medical. And so if this were to take place today, uh, that would have a resource responding from another town. But uh, not, not from our own town. Not That's what I was going to say. No. So the expansion that has occurred to date, as well as your future plans, mm -hmm. would not actually address that. And I, I have to quote my, my colleague, Mr. Lianos, who had said, um, I'm being told that all of the firemen would go to the fire, so we're <coughs> back at ground zero here. We're not accomplishing anything in terms of addressing the increasing medical calls. We're just increasing the staff. So, so I guess my, my question is, um, in the hypothetical situation that you've now had these promotions mm -hmm. of four lieutenants to four captains and four uh, firefighters up to lieutenant, you know, that has reduced the number of firefighters actually down to 28, correct? I mean, the, to the total number. In, in rank, hasn't but changed. not in capacity. No, I understand. But in terms of uh, the, the grade A firefighters, has actually been reduced. Well, the so captain's still a grade A firefighter. He can still put on his got pack and, no, 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 and no, assist in operations. Absolutely. Right. He's absolutely. still operational. Uh, they're, they're, they can still be dispatched. I, I understand that. But I guess what I'm saying is in the hypothetical situation that you don't get any more career firefighters, uh, currently 36 per shift, right? Mm -hmm. How could you allocate those 36 people to best meet the needs <coughs> of the people of North Haven, particularly uh, addressing the increased number of medical calls? The way we're doing it right now, we have to be able to staff both fire and EMS. And I will tell you, my incentives to increase staff was not because of that 2017 occurrence. Mm -hmm. That's what brought to, was brought to light by the public. That's mm -hmm. what captured the media attention. What I will tell you is that I was already having meetings with the public, and when that individual who lost her husband came mm -hmm. in to see me, what put her at ease with me was knowing that I had made such a conscious effort to meet with the public and identify the needs of the community. And I showed her the presentation I provided, and I showed her the people that I had met with. And she realized that it was nothing new to North Haven. It was something that had been going on for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. So 2017, in some people's eyes, it may have been the wake-up call for them, but it wasn't for me. Mm -hmm. I was already working on addressing the multiple calls that were occurring in town. It just hadn't captured the media's attention yet. Right. Chief so the way, that we're, I'm sorry, the way that we're going to staff mm -hmm. is going to take care of the multiple calls that are occurring both on the fire and the EMS, and we, you know, we can look at how many calls are occurring at any given time, and we know what our capacity is, mm -hmm. you know, so our, we don't, people refer to surge. Surge for us is not two or three calls. That's normal. Surge for us would be four to five calls occurring at any given time. 
-hmm. I don't intend necessarily to get us to the point of staff where we can staff with the surges, but right now, even at two or three calls taking place, there's times we don't have enough resources to respond. Mm -hmm. Okay, so just looking back historically, before the paramedic program, mm -hmm. back in the 1990s, there were only seven people per shift. Mm -hmm. So three on an engine, two on a ladder, and two on rescue. And that was the case for like 40 years, Sure. right? And then we increased up to eight per shift, four on an engine, two on the ladder, two on rescue. And mm -hmm. we were told you had to have four, had to have four on an engine. And now that we're up to nine, uh, now we can have three on two separate engines, mm -hmm. right? So my question is, is it possible to have two engines and two rescues? I'm sorry, three, three on an engine, three on a ladder, two on a rescue, two on a rescue, rather than, sorry, the second engine, mm -hmm. right? For a total of nine. Sure. Again, going back to my original question of, if we couldn't go beyond the staffing that you currently have, mm -hmm. could you do this? I know you don't want to, mm -hmm. <laughs> but could you do this? Contractually, no, not any longer. The, co the contract actually identifies how many have to be staffed on an apparatus by engines and by rescues and by trucks. So we would be violating collective bargaining agreement. And furthermore, the operations of a two-man engine are not consistent with, with the <coughs> fire service. If you look at... You no, 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 sir. Let, let me repeat it again. Mm -hmm. Three on an engine, yep. three on a ladder, two rescues, and two rescue and two on a second rescue, second ambulance, or okay. however you want to call it. It could be it could be an SUV. I don't care what it is, sure. as long as it has the paramedic pack. Yep. Rather than two engines, a ladder, and one rescue. So that doesn't meet the needs of suppression. Well, again, if if seventy percent of our calls nobody ever said seventy percent. My my numbers continue to be sixty to sixty three percent or so thereabouts. Um, but what about those thirty percent that are fires? He, he still needs the ability to. to Suppress a fire. Yeah, no, I, I'm not saying you, you yeah. don't have the ability to, I mean, because we have seven engines in here in town, right? But if you don't have the seven. men on the engine. Right. We have seven engines, and you know, only one of them is staffed mm -hmm. on, on a couple of shifts right now. And those other ones that I show, the reason I show those numbers is because those other engines aren't responding roughly half the time. So I'm not in the, in the practice of, of playing, uh, playing the odds. The 30% of the fires are real fires. If we don't respond and we don't get there, they're going to become bigger fires. We need to be able to prepare to respond to both the fire and EMS services that are occurring in town simultaneously, which is why the second engine at Mono East is staffed with a paramedic and can also combat fire. But the 30% the are actually calls for fires. They're not actual fires, right? Okay, yeah. Right, so th there's a difference. The, the actual sure. number of fires is significantly less than that. Correct. Okay. Okay. So again, I think we're all in the business. There's still a fire. They still start off as a fire call, which necessitates the need for a fire resource to respond. Sure. No, no, no. I, I understand that. I, I'm just trying to understand sure. how we can address an aging population with an increasing need for medical calls without opening a second ambulance. And it a sounds like... Second ambulance or a second... Second rescue vehicle. Right. So that, that's really what I'm suggesting here, is okay. keep one engine, one ladder, but open up a second ambulance. Again, with just nine people. You just said three, you wanted to three, avoid a two, second two. ambulance. Right. So, okay. so could we do that and actually ad better address, use our current mm. resources to better address the, ne the medical needs of our town? It would be satisfying only the medical needs of the town only and not the fire and medical needs. So I, I don't support it. I think that's where the 65 years of, of, of senior management skill and expertise and education comes into play. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, from the fire commission standpoint, we put our trust and, and confidence in the leadership of the fire department to disperse uh, personnel in the appropriate way to provide quality customer service to the residents of the town, both from the fire suppression standpoint and from, from the medical call standpoint. So um, I think you, know, you could come up with a whole litany of uh, well, various scenarios, but mm -hmm. the truth of the matter is, the senior management of the fire department has that skill and expertise right. uh, to disperse uh, personnel right. in, in the appropriate way. Right. And I think 
uh, our commission is truly comfortable in what the senior management has proposed. So um, I appreciate your, your 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 concern and other residents' concerns, but we we hear constantly from the residents of our town that we're providing quality customer service, um, and uh, certainly they are looking for enhanced services. And I think that's what the chief has proposed, and that's what our commission has proposed. Okay, but we, we on the Board of Finance are in the position of trying to decide how best to spend the taxpayers' dollars. So, well, you go ahead and so, vote on allocating those monies, so and our to... department leadership will spend the money in proportion to the monies that are allocated by this commission. Okay. Absolutely, that's your role, and our role is to spend the money in the appropriate way. I understand. And I'm, again, quoting another one of my colleagues, Mr. Donny, the vice chair of this, this commission, who said that just last year he was going to support adding uh, firefighters three and four of, of the eight that was in part of the plan, um, but he has significant, at least last year, reservations about adding the additional two this year and the next two next year, because again, we're being backed into a corner. If we add two in the next fiscal year, we will be with disproportionate shifts, and we will be forced to then hire another two in the next year. So uh, again, and I think that there's a prevailing fallacy or misguided belief that hiring more firefighters will decrease the cost of fire department overtime and contractual obligations. I think I don't you think know, I've ever said that. I don't think I've ever thought that. No, I'm saying that. No, absolutely not. I'm just saying people in, in the town of North Haven, I think I've heard this many, many times, so I'd just like to clarify this. Hiring more police officers and firefighters because of the, um, the uh, various replacement overtime, holidays, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, wind up being significant contractual obligations. And so I, I just think that we need to address that and also take a look at the proposed structure of the fire department, not only in terms of well, uh, I, think of I think we've covered we're, 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 that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I think, this is the I budget. Think the chairman, I think the chairman they've just made, alluded to that yeah. answer right there. And they've made their presentation. Uh, yeah. When we finalize our budget is really when this discussion would take place. I mean, unless you have a specific question. I have a specific question. Yes, sure. So we have an engineer at Monoways, right? Correct. Two, uh, budget for two of the four shifts, are you? Yeah. Okay. So on the two of the four shifts, is there a paramedic on the engine? Yes. So presumably a call goes out for a medical call if you <coughs> responded out of Central Station, right? No, if it's Monoways, we we'll respond for okay. Monoways. Yeah, fine. If there's a second call, we send out the other one, whether it's here or there, right? Mm -hmm. So is there any downside to having an engine in Monoways be the responding vehicle as opposed to a rescue vehicle? Not at That's all. That's an excellent question. Not at all. So, the travel time, I mean, is, is minimal, very minimal. Uh, and for that small downside, because that's just real life, right? I mean, you're talking mm -hmm. about a huge engine versus right. a rescue. I mean, I Absolutely. get it. So but for that small um, amount of time, you are covered that much more. I want you to think about perhaps the Model East side of town calling somebody uh, off, off Arrowdale <laughs> Road calling and saying, and my house is on fire, mm -hmm. and the rescue pulls up. What's the rescue going to do? It has no water. So, and, and, and the engine responding from here is 12 minutes away. We've, re we've increased the staffing of the department mm -hmm. to respond to both the increased medical calls and fire calls, right? Mm -hmm. and, and now we do have, where we didn't have before, we have, I'll just use the word rescue vehicles, I know it's not right, we have two rescue vehicles with paramedics that could respond where a couple years ago we didn't have that. Correct. Right. We have two paramedics, I think, would be the correct, right. because we don't right. have to rescue vehicles in right. service, but right. Yes. Yes, yeah, so we've improved the level of service provided to the taxpayer. That's what the taxpayer is getting. They're getting that, that dual role of, a, of an engine that has a paramedic and can also put out a fire and cut down on a 12-minute response time to that side of town. I think one of the challenges is people, people like us are very analytical. However, you're dealing with different situations every day. I went walking in my parents' neighborhood and I saw a fire engine go in for a medical call and I'm like, oh, in my mind was like, oh, the rescue's out somewhere, that's why, it, yeah. right? So mm -hmm. in my mind, we're analytical, everyone's trying to analyze, but the reality <coughs> is you have to make decisions based on what's going on at the moment. And that's really all that you can do. So 
in my opinion, for me, it's I can't analyze your job. You're running their department based on what is happening, and you're doing the best that you can. And if a fire engine does show up on a medical call, which I saw, my first reaction was, the rescues are out. There must be a lot going on at this time. Not like, oh, why is there a fire engine there? I, I, I mean, based on my knowledge. But that's for you guys to figure out because every day is different. It's not like you're going to a nine to five job and you can predict. So I get it, but I'm not going to question how, you, how you're running it and the fact that we do have a paramedic and model. However you need to do it, it it's, it's all judgment on what you're faced with every day. Sure. So while everybody wants this, and when they need the paramedic service or the fire, they want to be comfortable that someone's going to come. But you also have all these contingency plans that you mentioned earlier when I was asking you some questions for if there's a huge fire in town and other things are going on and we've got this PSA that, you know, I think all these things are definitely going to help. Um, that's just my opinion. Thank you. I just one last tactical question. Uh, what's the travel time difference between an engine leaving from Monowies going to the southern part of town versus an engine leaving from the headquarters? So last year I, I showed a, uh, a town property that I believe was on Brockett Farm Road. Okay. I use a town property for obvious reasons. Sure. The travel distance according to Rand McNally, which I credit to be a, a credible source, uh, was 12 minutes to go from headquarters to Brockett Farm Road. Okay. The travel time from Mono East to that side of town is probably six to eight. I don't, I didn't run it, but okay. I know that it's that much shorter. So in terms of somebody who's having um, a house fire versus somebody who's having a, uh, a cardiac arrest, the travel distance, I can tell you the other day we had a call, and you can, it's public record, you look at it. We had a, five calls the other day in that side of town when that engine was staffed in that mm -hmm. shift. And it, it made a huge difference in our response times made a huge difference to those taxpayers that were calling for fire and even <coughs> resources on that side of town. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks, Mr. Appreciate it. Anything anyone else have anything for the chief? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, Mike. Um, the, um, <clears throat> the two additional firefighters per year, it, or, um, uh, it started off at the uh, half year point. It started off, in, I believe, in, Jan uh, in a, in a uh, January of a, of a fiscal year, I guess, mm -hmm. two years ago. And so um, each year we're adding two more at the, the midpoint of the year, and, and therefore we're, we're, we're funding two full positions, that is to uh, backfill for the, the two that were hired mid-year in the previous year and two that are hired in the, in the, in the next fiscal year. So we're still hiring at mid-year, is that right? Whatever the board would like to do, we can hire mid-year. We can hire in no, July. That means that is, is that, yeah. is that yes, right? That's, 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 that's our intention. It's mid-year. That's, mid that's, mid that's the way it's always been. Um, and of course, all, all these uh, uh, two plus two plus two, they, they, they never end up qualifying for us to apply for any sort of safer grant or any other grant that would cover personnel on a temporary basis mm -hmm. for a few years. Um, so that's unfortunate. But the, uh, uh, so the Monowis uh, transition uh, has occurred where it was strictly a volunteer house and now we have firemen stationed there, at least two of the four. It will be soon, yeah. Yep. Two right now it's four, one, 20, two four soon. 24 hour shifts <coughs> down there. So they, they are, so, so that's, so they're, 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 they're using it residential. They're, they're, that's their sleeping quarters too. Correct. Yeah. That is, uh, that, that's, that's quite a transition that, that uh, has been talked about for years. And I just didn't know that it, it had occurred. And uh, now with the, uh, the movement of the lieutenants to captains and so forth, um, uh, you, you're, 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 uh, you're positioning the staff uh, where you want them for, um, for, 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 for larger scene response. That's correct. Yeah. Which is, uh, and I want to thank you once again for your participation in the, the workshop that Mr. Monaco and I uh, had with you and, the, uh, and, and Scott uh, mm -hmm. over the previous year or so, and uh, it, it really was quite beneficial to our understanding of what, what uh, you do and the situations you face and the resources you need. Um, with the, uh, <coughs> regarding what we did with the vehicles, uh, with the, the, um, the replacement that uh, is, is, is necessary for all vehicles that age, um, 
we, uh, we, you know, we, all the recommendations that we came up with at that time uh, have pretty much been en enacted. You replaced uh, engine one, and, and we were replacing the ladder mm -hmm. truck with another used vehicle here, uh, another previously uh, uh, used vehicle, and um, and uh, of course in in these recommendations is. Uh, is one here to uh, set aside money every uh, every year for f future vehicle replacement? So that that three hundred thousand that's in that capital uh, line there is uh, seems seems very very appropriate and very much in agreement. I think with how uh, this 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 board wants to handle uh, things down the road so that we don't get stuck. Your toys are too expensive. And I know. I can't control <laughs> it. I know. They are. You know, you know, Mike, very Michael, we, uh, our fire commission was uh, uh, probably implemented 85% of, yeah. of, of what the proposal that uh, this commission made to our board of yeah. fire commission. Uh, absolutely, and I I agree it was with you. It's a great experience. I, absolutely, uh, I was just going to say that I agree with you. I think it was the only a wonderful. Thing could have made it better. It was a wonderful educational experience for <laughs> for the board of finance. What could have made it better? A hundred percent. Well, you know. The, yeah. You have so, your job to do, we have our job to do. Yeah. So so left over from that and beyond our control is the, the, the volunteer situation. Now, you, you gave us numbers of, of 14, 11, and 13 as term, uh, in, in, uh, for the numbers that are in each volunteer house right now. <coughs> when we sat down, what were, the, were the numbers, what were the numbers back then? I mean, that, it seems as though I, I didn't think they were that low at that point. Yeah, so just at the risk of just so, not So what has the change been in the last year or two? Sure, I, I, and it's funny, I, I actually can pull that up rather easy. Give me, uh, give me one second to do so. But it hasn't changed much. If you want the exact number, I can, I'm going to no, figure no, it out no. now. All right, all right. But it's oh, within no, one okay. or two. Yeah, but yep. the, so the recommendations that we had on the firefight uh, volunteers, you've, you've again, <clears throat> you've, you've enacted virtually all of them. You've integrated the training. You've enhanced the volunteer experience. Mm -hmm. uh, you, um, you've, inc we, as a town, Mr. Frieda and others have uh, made sure that the the tax uh, deferment <coughs> benefit has uh, mm -hmm. is increased for these people, mm -hmm. and um, and you've posted um, road signage. You've you've, you've tried to uh, to actively advertise uh, the, the need for fire uh, volunteers in town. Mm -hmm. Uh, the only item that's not yeah, really. maybe not complete is, is the development of the Northeast Training Facility, Correct. which is still underway. Still underway. Uh, um, so you, you've done everything there, and yet still you you haven't held steady in, in numbers. So uh, I can give you the numbers that were hit last year. So uh, West Ridge, it was 13 qualified, one probationary. Mono East, it was 11 qualified, five probationary. In Northeast, it was 15 qualified, one probationary. Right, well, that is the same number. So it's pretty numbers. much the same. The same yes. Okay. Well, uh, good luck, and we hope that the volunteers do not become extinct. We uh, we need them in those the volunteer <coughs> houses. And they do a marvelous job. They do. They absolutely do, we, and we they save this town significant yeah. monies. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think it's worth noting, and, and thank you for queuing that up. Is it's important to note that that it's not their fault that they can't get out half the time. They have careers and full-time jobs yeah. and, and much like everybody else and as hard as it is for people to volunteer on commissions such as this imagine having to be a volunteer firefighter and obligate a, a night of your week and be able to drop what you're doing at any given time and go to calls so it's hard it's not their fault it's not a reflection on them it's just the numbers the numbers aren't there anymore all right um, uh, and the career side the, uh, the, the, the the contract that you're uh, the, the labor contract are we in year three of a three-year contract uh, entering in, in this next uh, the year? contract will expire in two more years in two more years oh because uh, yeah because the last one expired I thought in 2017 uh, so it might have been a four-year contract but okay um, I suppose that uh, that's, uh, that's uh, I see you good Michael that's all I have for now. Any other members? Just one question. You mentioned a training facility. Uh, is that uh, in process uh, behind Northeast? It is, sir, yeah. So uh, <coughs> we secured an architect uh, quite a while ago. The architect is now in the final stages of preparing those plans. Uh, they are meeting with the building department uh, this week or next to finalize the plans in accordance with the building department. They have to submit a modification to the state building department because 
it's a projected to be a five-story building as as allowed for by zoning and it doesn't meet the the modern um, building codes because it's such a unique style building so naturally the codes don't really allow you to build a building like this so they have to submit some paperwork to the state to get what's called a modification and get it legally built so that should be uh, working with mr. Frieda that should be taking place soon good and we have money in, uh, we have money put aside Jim, uh, from Quinnipiac's uh, voluntary payment to the town that will go towards the, that project. So. Mm -hmm. Great. And as far as dispatch goes, are, um, the, police, the police. police are coming. Yeah, and the police are coming. Are you, uh, have you seen any improvement there? Where I know they're going through a transition uh, and, and, and an expansion, I think. But uh, are, are, are you happy with the, the resources that are applied there right now and in the way that... Yeah, the, the um, that, that you know, dispatch fit. falls under police, but it's kind of a shared resource. Yeah. You know, the, uh, the addition to the dispatching staff took place in January. So they're still kind of getting up and running with, with how the, it's going to be moving forward. So we haven't yet um, experienced what it's going to look like, but we are very in much involved with the police department and the administration of the police department and working on how that's going to be uh, be provided for. There, there's an intent to take back the EMD, which is going to be huge for us. Um, it's going to cut down on response times. And there's uh, there's obviously going to be some improvements made, as, as you are aware of. Triage alone meetings, will be a big difference. Right? Right. Yeah, just in, so, in that's how gonna, that's be huge. <clears throat> I mean, and again, that was the first time we've made enhancements to dispatch in, in decades. Okay. Uh, and by the way, rescue vehicles. Um, you, you, we, you know, you, uh, obviously the primary and the backup are all getting more miles. Uh, at, at what point might you have to come to us for something like sure, that? Sure. I believe I identified that in your five-year capital plan. Okay. I'll look at that. Thank you. All right, we're all good. Thank you, Chief. Thank, Thank you very much. Chief. We are adjourned. The preceding program is brought to you in part through a grant from the town of North Haven. Watch town meetings or other videos on demand at NHTV.com.